Hey, how's it going? I'm Pastor Mike from Good Hope Church, and I am happy to welcome you to our digital service today. So glad you could be with us. A couple preliminaries. First thing I want to make sure you know about our website, goodhope.ag, and it has all the information of different things that are going on, and you can get involved with you know, some of our videos, daily devotions, podcasts, old sermons, stuff like that. And you can find out all the different things that are going on in our live service. So goodhope.ag is a great thing. The other uh, thing I want to let you know about is uh, appreciate your faithful giving. If you're giving to Good Hope Church, thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Here's how we give at Good Hope. We give as the Spirit directs. So you pray, you seek the Lord on what you're supposed to do, and then you do that. I believe that if we all do that, it's going to work out just fine. And uh, if you want to give, you can give online through the website. We've got the Church Center app. You can also send us a letter. 55 Armory Road, Cloquet, Minnesota, 55720 is our physical address. All right. Then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to spend some time worshiping the Lord. This is a very important part of being a believer is just spending some time connecting with God in worship. We're called to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and so we need to spend some time doing that, and basically that's worship. Now, for some people, worshiping in song is just natural, and it flows, and it works very well. Other people, maybe they're not music types, or you you know what I mean. Uh, If if you aren't a music type person, you might think, well, I can worship God. I just am not good with singing. Then do whatever you need to do. I encourage you to feel free. You don't have to, you know... You don't have to crank the music up and sing with it, but let's take some time and get our hearts right with God. Be thankful, honor the Lord, tell Him about how much we love Him. Let's just spend some time in worship. To breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone And mercy fills the streets To look upon The one who bled to save me And walk with him For all eternity
Hallelujah. We praise your name, Jesus. We thank you for all that you've done, that you have made us part of your family, that you have welcomed us in, and that we can have eternal life in the paradise of God because of what you have done for us. You are great, you are mighty, you are holy, and you are worthy of all worship. So we pour it out to you today, Lord.
Praise your name. You and you alone are worthy of our worship. So we pour it out to you, Lord. Hey, it's good to worship the Lord. Amen. Always good to spend time in worship. We're going to pray today for our one minute blessing. Every service we pray together because when God's people pray, it moves the hand of God and it changes the heart of the, uh, the people who pray. In our live service, we've got Pastor Kayla, our kids pastor, who's going to be talking about the kids' worship experience that they call Kids XP through the Minnesota District of the Assemblies of God. A bunch of elementary age kids get together in different places across the state, and they just have like a little retreat worship time. And that's coming up uh, in a month, and we're almost to our deadline for sign up, so that's why we're talking about it, trying to make sure people know about it so that they can participate. But what I want to pray about uh, for our one-minute blessing is just for the next generation. You know, the, the stats aren't real great. Two weeks ago, we talked about that some. But uh, if we can help the next generation know and love God, boy, that makes a big difference. And so I want to pray for elementary age kids that, uh, you know, because that's, Jesus said, you know, that, uh, the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And so let's pray blessings over elementary age kids and just pray that they'd be able to see an untainted, unmediated uh, version of who God is and the love of God. So let's pray along those lines. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those precious ones, elementary age kids and even younger, Lord, let's just put the uh, the nursery and preschool age kids in there too. And Lord, we pray your blessings over these ones. Lord, we pray that they, in their uh, innocent, um, just untainted minds, would be able to see you for who you are, see the love you have for them, and that they would just be able to grab hold of who you are, uh, because the kingdom of of Heaven belongs to, to those kids. And so, Lord, we pray your blessings upon them. We lift up the parents and the families, the schools and the churches, the teams that are part of the lives of these kids. And we pray, Lord, that they would be good influences and bring them into the joys of this life, being able to face challenges uh, with faith and encouragement and strength, and that they would grow up strong, knowing and loving you and being good examples of you. So, Father, we pray your blessings on on that next generation, kids and nursery and preschool age ones as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So happy to have Pastor Kayla leading our kids' ministry. She's doing just a fantastic job. All right, let's continue on our series. Uh, last week, we had a special guest speaker here live. We had uh, Bishop Michael Grant, and his message will be next week, because then live here, we're going to have Pastor Daniel preaching, uh, kind of a preliminary to his Thursday night testimony nights that he's going to be doing here coming up in uh, next few weeks. So uh, you can check the website for information on that. Uh, goodhope.ag. But we spent two weeks now in a series that we're calling Power of the Word, and it's a pretty simple concept. 
Let's look into the Bible, find the life-changing truths of the Word, and let's just talk about them and let me preach on them. Kind of good old-fashioned, you know, a little bit riled up kind of preaching is what I'm going for. Uh, when I go to Jamaica, I tell them I'm pretty, I'm pretty fiery from Minnesota, and they all just laugh and laugh and laugh because I'm the most boring thing they have ever seen in their lives. But I'm trying to give it a little bit of fire, and so we're in the third week of this one, and today we're going to talk about following God, doing the teachings, doing what the Bible says. You know, we're calling it trust and obey, and uh, that's just so important. Changed my life. So trust and obey, you might think, is a little bit of a boring concept, but this is where the rubber meets the road and where you're going to have the most effective change in your life is if you can trust and obey the Lord. So let's pray. We'll get into this new material. So Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy scriptures. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Father, that you don't leave us here to just guess our way through life alone and uh, aimless, but you guide us by your Holy Spirit and you guide us by your holy word. Father, I pray that you would guide us both by your spirit and by your word, that you'd bring your word to life through your spirit, and then it would speak to our hearts and we'd be able to grab a hold of something good. Lord, I know each one of us is going through different things. We've got different obstacles in our way. We've got different things we need to make sense of. And so, Lord, I pray that you would meet us, each one individually, personally, and you would just download something good into our minds and into our hearts so that we can take hold of that for which you have taken hold of us. So, Father, bless our time. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Old concept, important truth. Last time, two weeks ago, when we were talking about loving your neighbor, because Jesus said the most important thing is to love God. The next thing is to love your neighbor. And so last time, two weeks ago, we talked about what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 24 through 27, which is this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So the point of this is, if you trust and obey, if you read the teachings of Jesus, the basic biblical teachings, and you put them into practice, then it's like building your house on a rock. When storms of life happen, you're going to be sustained through it. But if you know what you're supposed to do, but you don't do it, then everything's going to come crashing down. Very, very important concept, very, very true, but it's also something that people have been trying to explain away since Jesus said it 2,000 years ago. Now, don't be like that. Don't, don't try to explain that. Oh, no, 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 no. You see, we can do all the different things, not what Jesus said. We can ignore all of that. But because God is gracious, then everything still works out just fine. Our house doesn't crash. Don't come up with some goofy theology that negates the word of God and makes it so that you don't have to actually do what Jesus taught. Don't be like that. Instead, love God. If you love God and let yourself be loved by God, then you get to live in a transformational relationship with God. Now, I believe that, that the Lord wants to transform us and bring us into His goodness and glory so we can participate in the divine nature and be part of what God is doing. And that's what this stuff is all about. Romans 12, 2, one of my very favorite uh, verses in the Bible, says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. I finally got there. Let's see how close I was. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
So we're not to conform to the pattern of this world. That means you don't do things like the world does. Don't just look out for number one and lie to people to get ahead and hurt people. And, you know, don't be doing that. Uh, instead, do things how Jesus said to do them. Love God, love your neighbor, you know, do the teachings of Jesus. Then we get to be transformed into who God meant for us to be in the first place. So let's, let's love God and be transformed by God into who God sees us, how he created us to be, and grab hold of the fullness of what this life has to offer through that. You know, this comes through the transformational love of God that builds us up into who we're really meant to be. However, if you don't love God, then you're stuck with a transactional relationship with God. That means you're trying to do the least you can do to get the benefit. That means you're trying to, okay, well, I mean, I don't have to actually follow all this stuff, right? I mean, I don't have to, uh, you know, I don't have to serve. I don't have to give. I don't have to do, I don't have to really do anything, right? I can just sort of believe and then I go to heaven, right? I mean, I prayed the prayer the one time 38 years ago. I'm good, right? You know? And then trying to do as little as possible in a transactional way to try to get the benefit they want and give as little for it. This is a transactional relationship with God. It's what happens if you don't love God. that You're stuck with that, trying to do the least you can to get the benefit, and then you're probably resisting along the way because you don't understand that it's the love of God that transforms us into who he wants us to be it's not that he's mad at us and so we better do these things to stop him from being so mad or otherwise we're going to be in real trouble. You know, like that's a, a second grader's idea of getting in trouble with the principal. We're called to be friends of God. We're, we're supposed to be on the same team. We're supposed to get it, walk with God. So let me give you an example. Let's do an example of a, of a hockey player. Now, how can you tell if a hockey player loves hockey? What do they do with their free time? Are they thinking about hockey when they shouldn't be thinking about hockey? You know, they're skating <laughs> in the wee hours of the morning. Whenever they get a chance, they're stick handling. They're, they're taking shots. They're just having as much fun playing whenever they can. They're always wanting to jump in. They're learning plays. They're just they're, they're understanding how it all works because they love hockey. Drills are even fun because they know they're getting better. However... If a hockey player gives very little effort, you know, just does as little as possible, just trying to get by, you know, they probably don't love hockey. Maybe they got a hockey family and they've been told they have to play hockey or whatever, and they don't really love hockey, but they're kind of being forced into it. You know, they don't love hockey. So just like if somebody loves hockey, they're going to, they're going to sneak out to play hockey. You know, they're going to, they're going to practice on their own because they just love it. They enjoy it. It's fun. Skating and cutting and shooting and, and all the stuff. They just enjoy it. They love it. They're going to lean in. And so if we're to love God, then that means that, that we enjoy it. And if bad religion has sucked the life out of knowing God, then I pray that you would get set free from that. Maybe in the next, uh, you know, 28 minutes or so, we'll be able to solve that problem. Next half hour or so, we'll be able to solve that problem. I hope so, because it, what a tragedy to be stuck in a transactional relationship with God and with religion when you can actually have a transformational, you know, loving relationship with God that is fun and brings you up to take hold of the, the most you can ever have in this life way better. So let's go ahead and embrace it. Like somebody who loves hockey, let's love God. Let's go ahead and walk the walk. Let's live the life. Let's trust and obey. Let me tell you what happened to me when I decided to trust the Bible. Now, this was years ago. You know, I, w I didn't come from a Christian background. And so when I got to the place where I was I had an experience with God. I'm like, I don't even know what to do with this. So I'm trying to learn the Bible and, and uh, I'm kind of judging the Bible. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not sure that I, cause I don't know what's going on. And I'm like, I, how do I even know if this is true? And, uh, you know, one, one time my pastor came up to me cause we'd been talking about, you know, the Bible and that sort of a thing. And he's like, well, what do you think? You know, 
do you, do you believe the Bible's true? You know, good, happy, smiley guy. And, and I'm like, well, you know, I believe in the, the fallibility of man. And I see man's fingerprints all over this thing. That's what I, that's what I told him. And he kind of, he wasn't sure what to do with that. But you know, basically what I was saying is like, like people have touched this and I bet they've messed this up. That was, that was what my thought was. And so I thought, okay, well, I got to prove it out then. I'm going to start, I'm going to go verse by verse through this whole thing. And I'm going to find out if it's true. I'm going to test it. I'm going to prove it out. I'm going to judge it and see. And I started in Genesis chapter one, and I got to tell you, I did not get past Genesis chapter one. I'm like, I do not have the tools to be able to tell if this is true or not. So I'm either going to have to believe this by faith, or I'm going to have to not. You know, the way I saw it was like, I'm driving in a fog towards a cliff at 80 miles an hour. I better turn left or right, you know, because if I go straight, I'm going off the cliff. So I'm like, okay, uh, I'm going to believe it because. How do I know? You know what I mean? But if when I go and stand before God and I say, look, I, I believe this because I didn't want to make my own judgments. They said it's your book. I prayed out of your book. You answered my prayer. I just figured it's got to be true, so I'm going to put my faith in it and go with it. I thought I can stand before God and do that if it turns out that the Bible is flawed, but I didn't want to say, oh, well, yeah, okay, turns out your Bible was true, but I, you know, I just thought my own ideas were probably better. You know, like, I don't want to stand before God with that one. That wouldn't be so good. So I thought, okay, I'm going to believe the Bible. And then something amazing happened. After that, after I decided to trust in the Bible as holy, inspired, inerrant word of God and authority over my life. So what that meant was I was choosing if Jesus says do something, I'm saying, okay, I'm going to do it. If Jesus says love your neighbor, I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it, you know. And after I trusted the Bible, then my life began to change. There were some very notable examples. I'm going to go with 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says this, Now you are the body of Christ, that's the plural you, all y'all, all y'all are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Now, I got to tell you, I did not feel like I belonged. You know, I was, had long hair. I loved I had long blonde hair. I loved it. Man, oh, good old days. Uh, I had long blonde hair. You know, it was kind of wispy. Obviously, it all fell out, you know, except for the little bit that I shave off now because it's not worth having. You know, I had this long blonde hair, wore ratty clothes, you know, kind of bum hippie like looking guy studying philosophy you know asking horrible questions in the bible studies and stuff that people didn't know how to answer and and they were unsure of me and people were like okay you you know they they just didn't know what to do with me so i didn't feel like i belonged i didn't understand half the things that they said cuz they used all these weird words and i you know i just didn't feel like i belonged i went to church and i thought these are not my people i don't belong here I love Jesus. I must not be one of these people. I'm just a normal person who trusts Jesus as Lord and Savior. I'm just a normal person who does that. I'm not one of them. I don't even know what that is. But then I, I read 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now all y'all are the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. So, okay, well, if I believe this, if I'm trusting in this, then this means that I belong to the body. I'm part of the body. I cannot not be part of the body. I am part of the body. So I might feel like I don't belong. I'm going to go ahead and belong. I might feel like, you know, nobody understands me, but that's no excuse. I, I'm part of the body. Each one of you are part of it. So I'm going to go be part of the body. I'm going to go participate. I'm going to go get involved. Even if people look at me funny and they're not so sure if I should be there or not, I'm just going to go ahead and belong because it says I do, and so I'm going to do it. I'm going to trust it. I'm going to put it into practice. And then here I am. I got to be part of this. Hallelujah. Matthew 6, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. A bunch of people were nervous and worried about what they're going to eat, what they're going to wear, and that sort of a thing. And, and so Jesus says, hey, man, don't worry about it. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So I'm like, okay, if I want to be taken care of, 
I have to do the counterintuitive thing of not worrying about my own needs. Instead, I need to worry about the kingdom of God. What is best for the kingdom of God? You know, the, the movement of bringing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to this world you know, that's my participation in the kingdom of God, you know, the kingdom of God, and then his righteousness. So that means do things the way God would want you to do them. Should you lie or not? No. Should you steal or not? No. You know, commit adultery or not? No. So you don't want to do the wrong thing. You want to do the right thing. And then that's going to be your best life. All these things will be given to you as well if you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So started doing that, started, uh, you know, especially from a ministry perspective. Our visitor packets have the other church's addresses in them, you know, like it's his kingdom. It's not Good Hope Church. It's not, you know, Pastor Mike and everybody follow me. No, you go follow Jesus. It's about his kingdom. And I tell you what, that has been one of the best things we've ever done is follow Matthew 6.33 as a church. When we first started, we advertised other churches. Uh, when we were having an offering, we'd have an offering video. We had pastors from the, the churches in town come, you know, do a, a video for us. And so, like, we had Pastor Fred over at Journey. It was uh, Cloquet Gospel Tab, and Pastor Fred was like, hey, you know, we want to welcome Good Hope Church here to uh, Cloquet, be part of our uh, you know, our family of faith here in Cloquet. I hope you're having a good time at the service today. But if you don't feel like Good Hope is a fit for you, check out <laughs> Cloquet Gospel Tab. Our services are, you know, here at these times, and we had a bunch of different churches around uh, do videos like that. And one of the ladies that came to church, first time she was here, we had one of those videos on, and she began to cry. And she thought, this is where I belong. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and these things are added to you as well. We had people, you know, just wanting to lean into Good Hope Church because we didn't put Good Hope Church. We were like, we're better than all the other churches, so you better come here. You know, like, it wasn't that. It was, hey, there's lots of good churches in town. We want to do our part, but, you know, we're just wanting to advance the kingdom of God, not my kingdom, not Good Hope Kingdom. And all these things are added to you as well. I've seen it over and over again. Life started to change. Oh, let's see here. Ephesians 5, 21 through 28. This is the one about, well, let me just read it. I'm going to try to do it fairly quick. We're going to run out of time. But this actually was a big life change for me and my wife because we had this backwards. You know, the the man is the spiritual head of the home and all that stuff, which has been grossly uh, distorted at different times in history and has been a bit of a disaster, which was what makes it hard to talk about. But, but you know, I was the youngest. I just kind of went along with everything. I didn't really care about much. She was the oldest, you know, she was the little boss over her uh, siblings and all of that, you know, and, and we got married and she sort of took control and I kind of let it all happen. And, and then she had no respect for me and that was no good. So I didn't love her and it just got to be this mess. And we decided, you know, we need to switch this around. We need to do it the other way. We need to, we need to follow what this is and, and, and have me, my wife and I both together were like, you know what, this isn't working. Let's go ahead and do what the Bible says, and Mike, you be the spiritual head of the home. I'm like, okay, if I have to, and uh, <laughs> a little bit of a joke there, but but I didn't care. You know, I don't have this, like, I want to be in charge thing. I, I, I really don't. I'm happy by myself stacking rocks or whatever, you know, uh, splitting wood. That's a pretty good day for me, but let me just read through this real quick. And uh, we endeavored to do this, and our lives changed. Our marriage changed dramatically. Still lots of stuff for us to learn, but I love how it starts on verse 21 now. The little subheading is above 21, which I think is super helpful, solves a lot of problems. But here we go. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So who submits to who? Everybody for everybody. But there's a special emphasis with wives. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husband as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. As we see at the end of the passage, verse 33, you know, this is 
respect your husbands. Yield to your husbands, you know, let, let them make some decisions, stuff like that. Respect the husband. Then, of course, we know from Scripture that everybody's supposed to love everybody, right? There we go. Love God, love your neighbor, love your brother and sister in Christ, love your enemy. Love is, is supposed to be all out there, but there's a special emphasis for husbands loving their wives. Verse 25, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So I wasn't loving her because I resented her for taking charge of everything, and and uh, she didn't respect me, and it was this huge disaster. And so then it was like, okay, you make some decisions. You be a man and actually step up. And and my wife was like, I'll, I'll follow that. You know, that was a little bit of a process, but it was a dramatic change when we actually put this into practice and I actually started taking responsibility for things instead of just abdicating responsibility, letting her make a decision. Then if it goes wrong, go, well, I knew what we should have done and it all fell apart because you did it that way. And then resenting her for those things. And then she's mad at me for not taking uh, responsibility. But instead now I take responsibility I step up, be the man of the house, be a sp spiritual leader, which is a servant leader like Christ loving the church. If the husband doesn't love the wife, this does not work at all. You got to love your wife. You got to want to lift her up like Christ does, because if I submit to Christ or I respect Christ, I'm stronger for it. I'm better for it. And so here's, the, here's my bottom line little statement for that for men who want to exploit this. Being the spiritual head of the home is not a position you can exploit. You know, like, I'm the king, off with their head, you know, that sort of thing. It isn't a position you can exploit. Rather, it's a responsibility you'll be held accountable for. If you don't love your wife, if you aren't kind to her, if you're harsh, you're going to be judged by God because you're responsible for being the spiritual leader in your home. And if you fail at that, God's going to judge you for it. So this isn't something that you, you know, oh, I get to be the bully of the house and nobody can do anything. No, that's an a, a egregious abuse of power. It is not what God wants, and you're going to be judged for it. Instead, love your wife, build her up, strengthen her, uh, love her and respect her. She's going to respect you and love you, and then all of a sudden good things happen. Changed my life. So there's so many other examples, because if you don't have to get very far in the Bible— before you're going to read something that if you actually put it into practice is going to change your life. You're not going to get, I don't care if you are a theologian with three PhDs, you start putting this into practice, your life is going to change. Why is that? It's because it's John 8, 31 and uh, 32, John 8, 31 and 32, a four-part process. Let's read those verses. We start putting things into practice, and we start to see what Jesus told us in just two short verses. John 8, 31 and 32 says this. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let me do my fingers a little different there. To the Jews who had believed him, he said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Four steps. First one is believe. First one is to, to trust who Jesus is, what he says. You know, they believed in him. They had faith. They had trust. They had love for God and his ways. And so the first thing is to believe, to trust, to have faith. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, it means if you actually do it, if you obey, if you hold to my teaching, it means if you actually do it. Maybe you trust in me, but you're afraid to put this into practice. Maybe you trust in me, but you trust in your own understanding more. And so when you read Ephesians chapter 5, you're like, I ain't doing that. You know, or you read, love your enemy, you're like, I ain't doing that. You know, because you trust your own understanding more than you trust the word of God. If you won't obey, then this isn't going to work. Step one is 
believe, you know, trust, have faith. Step two, obey, actually put it into practice. That's what makes them disciples, not hearing and knowing. That doesn't make them a disciple. And it's the actually doing of it. And then something happens. Uh, verse 32, then you will know the truth. Then you will know the truth. This comes after the doing, not before. It's very, very important. Then you will know the truth. What did I learn from doing 1 Corinthians 12, 27? You know, the, uh, all y'all are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. What did I learn from that? I learned it was scary. I learned that, you know, showing up for church and belonging where I didn't feel like I belonged was scary. I had a lot of social anxiety. I mean, like, as a kid, like, honestly, if, if I had to go up to the counter and order food at McDonald's, and, and I, I wasn't, like, forced to do that. I just wouldn't because it was easier for me to not eat than it was to go order food at McDonald's. Like, I had a significant level of social anxiety that I think today I would have been very much, like, labeled and maybe medicated. I don't know. But, I mean, like, I had a profound social anxiety. Um, I'm still nervous about stuff like that. But I was like, well, I'm just going to go do this because that's what it says. I, I, it was scary. Some people still didn't like me and wanted to push me out. You know, it wasn't easy. Being part and belonging was not easy. You know, you got to force your way in sometimes. It took years for there to be fruit from this. You know, just going ahead and belonging and being part. You know, it, it's hard work, takes time, and you don't really get anywhere for a long time. It can be years. Another thing I learned was that they belong, you know? If each one of you is a part of it, then that means that Journey, Christian Church, Pastor Fred, Pastor Hollis, you know, that they're part of it. Pastor Hollis did my oldest son's and his wife's marriage counseling or premarital counseling, you know? Like, we're all on the same team. We work together. You know, now if it's a church that preaches heresy or whatever, then we got a problem, but you know what I'm saying? Like, in the big bowl of pretty much trying to do what God wants you to do, there's a lot of churches in that big bowl. We're all on the same team trying to work it all out. So they belong. You know, in our visitor packet I mentioned earlier, we got the other churches on there. Why? Because they belong too. I don't own the sheep. There's lots of things that I learned trying to put that into practice. You know, you learn and grow as you try to put things into practice because you know, experience is a good teacher. And you can have a naive concept and then you put it into practice and then you realize it's a naive concept. Let me give you a, a funny, uh, bad example, which, you know, I, uh, I've shared in church before and it's, it's kind of the, the running joke, but Philippians 4.13, you know, the King James, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This NIV says it very different. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. All this, all what? All the stuff he was talking about, going through hardships and difficulties and that sort of thing. And not have it hurt his heart, you know, but he can be content. But in the King James, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I thought, well, if I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and I'm going to put my faith on not needing to sleep, I got a lot of stuff to do. And I'm going to go ahead and run with this thing. And so I believe God did not need to sleep. And uh, it worked for a while. <laughs> you know, when you're young and enthusiastic, you don't need to sleep much. But then I actually fell asleep while I was being introduced to someone. You know, that was, that, I was, that was so embarrassing. You know, I was immediately embarrassed. I immediately realized, okay, this is this is not what Philippians 4.13 means, that I don't have to sleep. You know, because it's true, God can do anything, but it's also true, he doesn't do just anything. You have to look at what the promises are and believe God for the promises. There's no promise that we won't need to sleep. So that's funny, but I learned that it just isn't, that's not how that works. We trust God for what God calls us to do, to give us the strength, to equip us, to give us the spiritual gifts necessary. We trust God for those things, but we don't get to just make up whatever we want. So then I learned some things, you know, some things I've even softened on. Matthew 6, uh, 1 through 4, Jesus is talking about your giving in the Sermon on the Mount. How do we give? 
Matthew 6, 1 through 4, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward for your, from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others with trumpets. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. They got to be the big man with the trumpet blowing while they gave a $20 bill to a needy person. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. I used to give only cash and not tell anybody. You know, like when the offering has come by, I'd even be sneaky. You know, I just, just cash folded so you couldn't even see what kind of bills it was. No envelope, no name, no check, just done, you know, sneaky. Well, that's a little much. You can write a check. You can get giving credit. Now I tell people that I support $100 a month through our Kingdom Investments Program, the Lake Geneva building project that we have at our camp over in Alexandria. You know, like that's my Kingdom Investment giving. You know, I still sometimes, you know, where I went to church on New Year's Day, I slipped some money in, you know, just cash. Like I, I still do that sometimes, but I was too harsh on that. I, I over-interpreted it, you know, uh, didn't really misinterpret, but I just took it too far. You know what I mean? And so some things you put it into practice, you realize, ah, I can probably set that back a little bit. And then, so step one from John 8, 31 and 32 is you trust in God, you believe, have faith, then you obey, you put it into practice, hold to the teachings, then you're going to know the truth. and Step four is the truth will set you free. It's fantastic. How does that work? Well, it's because you you know the eternal ways of God now. You get good at them, and this gets you the victory. This gets you, you know, you learn how it all works, and you get good at it. And so now you can grab hold of the fullness of what God has for you because you've been putting it into practice. You've been learning from your mistakes and you've been getting better over time. And now you're really starting to hit your stride, get in your flow, and you're walking in what God's plan is for you. And that's where you're free. You know, you, you learn how to uh, submit to God, resist the devil, and make him flee. You know, it's, it's freedom comes from practicing these things, seeing how it actually works, and then getting good at it. But you got to trust and obey. You got to put it into practice. You got the best coach in the universe with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. So trust and obey and get good at living in the ways of God. I hope you're catching this because this, this will change your life if you will open the Bible and just do what it says. So many people, of course, they don't open the Bible. And they do open the Bible. They just sort of smile and move on like, oh, I bet I don't have a sure. I don't have to do that, you know. But put it into practice because that's where we get the victory. That's where we win. That's where freedom comes from and knowledge before that. But it's obedience and faith on the other side. So it's that four-step process. You believe, you put it into practice, then you start to learn some stuff. You know, then you'll know the truth, and the truth sets you free. It's it's because you're getting to learn the ways of God. Trust and obey. Again, I hope you're catching it. Now, we're about to try to land the plane here. Obedience isn't about self-justification. You know, that's pride. Like, I'm doing this so good. I'm so awesome, and all you people are so horrible. You know, like, that's ugly, stinking pride, arrogance, yuck. Uh, obedience isn't about self-justification. It's not about trying to get God on your, uh, or to get on God's good side, you know, trying to manipulate God. Hey, did you see what I did for you? Are you going to throw me a bone here? You know, like it isn't about getting God on God's good side. Uh, it's about learning the amazing ways of the Lord who loves you so that you can get the most out of life. Our religious ideas get all messed up when we try to translate the transformational truths of the love of God into transactional rules that ignore the heart of God. 
when we try to translate a relationship with God that is redemptive and transformative into bad religion and, you know, transactional rules. A lot of people have gotten that all messed up because they're trying to figure out how do I go to heaven even though I don't love God? You just got to love God. But the good news is God loves you. God is, is worth loving back. Next week, Daniel's going to preach in, in the live service. We'll have Bishop Grant in the, uh, in the online service. And then the next break, we'll have Daniel. Uh, he's going to be doing some Thursday night testimony nights. Pastor Daniel, my youngest son. Uh, you can check out information about that on the website. Find out uh, the, the times and the dates and all that sort of stuff. But if you're going through a hard time, Daniel went through some hard stuff. You can really try to grab hold of something good at these testimony nights and get some freedom. But how are we going to finish up this sermon? Let's go to Matthew 8, 1 through 3. So this is actually just right after the Sermon on the Mount where, you know, Jesus finishes it up with, do what I say and you'll be like a house on a rock. Ignore it. It'll come crashing down. Then Matthew 8. So that basically finished Matthew 7. Then Matthew 8. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, so Sermon on the Mount, he's coming down off the mountain. Large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, this guy was breaking all the rules. A person with leprosy is supposed to shout unclean. It's like social distancing with, uh, you know, like the COVID rules, supposed to be six feet apart, all that stuff. They were supposed to stay with shouting distance apart of anybody else. Like if they could shout unclean and you could hear them, uh, then, okay, now it's time to turn around and go the other way. That was the social distancing rules for leprosy back in these days. This guy comes and kneels before Jesus and says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. How does Jesus respond? Verse 3, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy said a few things maybe might be a little bit hard to understand, but here's the deal. This is the transformational love of God. You come before God and you say, Lord, if you want, you can, you can heal my heart. You can, you can take this yuck out of my heart. You can take my anger. Lord, if you want, if you want to make me clean, you can. He wants to. Jesus broke the rules by touching them. But Jesus wasn't infected. He, the leper, received of the holiness and the power of God, and he was cleansed. The leper was transformed. That's how it's supposed to work. Not about a bunch of rules, again, all that stuff. It's about a God who loves you and wants you to get the most out of life be the fullness, the fullest person he created you to be. Grab hold of it and not be stuck by all this yuck. We put the word of God into practice. We get to take hold of that. But let's pray. If you need a touch from God like that leper, it's time to go before the Lord and ask. But let's pray. Let's finish this thing up. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and your love. Thank you that you are worth trusting and that your word is good. And when we put it into practice, we see our lives change and good things happen. Lord, thank you for the example of the leper who came before you. He knelt before you and asked for you to make him clean. And you were willing. You reached out and touched him and he was clean. Lord, for those who need a touch from you, as they call out to you as they call out to you right now. Lord, I pray that you would, uh, in the Spirit, touch them and make them clean. And they would know about a relationship with God that brings transformation rather than religious rules that bring condemnation and all that stuff. Lord, let us know your love by touching us and making us clean and leading us into that relationship that redeems and transforms. So, Lord, guide us in these things. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, and we thank you for your love. 
I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, so glad you could be here for our digital service. If you need some prayer, our prayer teams will answer emails, prayer at goodhope.ag. And so I just want to say from all of us here at Good Hope Church to you and yours, God bless. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.